different from the country the Minister of Finance described in her speech. A country where work pays, where everyone who's worked hard can afford a house, affordable food in safe communities. Canadians have a right to this. They deserve it. And with our common sense government, Canadians will get that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam President, I will continue in English. Oh no, Madam Speaker, I will be going on in English. I want to share this excellent speech with our English-speaking compatriots as well, Madam Speaker. After nine years of this Prime Minister's deficits, doubling the national debt, doubling housing costs, and a new budget that brings in $50 billion of new unfunded spending on promises he has already broken, this budget, just like this Prime Minister, are not worth the cost, and Conservatives will be voting no. But before I get into uh, the reasons why and my common sense plan to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime, I'd like to pay the Minister of Finance a compliment for a, a page in her speech that I thought was extremely illustrative. And I'm going to quote ver verbatim. I would like Canada's 1 percent, Canada's 0.1 percent, to consider this. What kind of Canada do you want to live in? Well, before I go any further, let's point out the incredible irony that, as she and her leader point out, Canada's 0.1 percent are doing better than ever after nine years of the Prime Minister promising to go after them. Yes, they have benefited from the tens of billions of dollars of undeserved corporate welfare handouts and grants, ironically supported by the NDP, of corporate loan guarantees that protect them against losses in cases of incompetence or dishonest bidding, of contracts of which there are now $21 billion granted to outside and highly paid consultants, many of them making millions of dollars a year in taxpayer contracts for work that could be done inside the government itself, if that work is of any value at all. And finally, those grand fortunes that have been inflated by $600 billion of inflationary money printing that have transferred wealth from the working class to the wealthiest among us. That 0.1 percent is doing better than ever after nine years of the Prime Minister pretending that he would get tough on them. But let me go on. I'm interrupting myself. <laughs> Do you want to live in a country, she asks, where you can tell the size of someone's paycheck by their smile? Wow. <laughs> How many Canadians are smiling when they look at their paycheck today? Mm. Madam yeah. Speaker, People are not smiling at all because a paycheck cannot buy you a basket of affordable food. According to Sylvain Charlebois, the food professor, he has said that the cost of a basket of food has gone up by thousands of dollars per year, but that the majority of Canadians are spending hundreds of dollars less than is required to buy that basket. That means that they are not getting enough food. We live in a country now where the average paycheck cannot pay the average rent. So nobody is smiling when they look at their paycheck, Madam Minister. She goes on to ask, do you want to live in a country where kids go to school hungry? Well, according to the Prime Minister, one in four kids are going to school hungry after his nine years. I look here at a press release that his government released uh, on April the 1st, April Fool's Day of all days where he says nearly one in four children do not get enough food. In fact, it says that they don't get enough food to learn and grow. So no, we don't want to live in a country where kids go to school hungry. But according to his own press release, 
We do live in a country where one in four kids do go to school hungry. She then says, do you want to live in a country where young Canadians, where, where only young Canadians who can buy their own homes are, the, the only young Canadians who can buy their own homes are those whose parents can help with a down payment? Madam Speaker, no, we don't want to live in that country, but we do live in that country today. According to data released by RBC Dominion, for the average family to afford monthly payments on the average home in Canada, they would have to spend 64% of their pre-tax income. Most families don't keep 64% of pre-tax income because they pay so much taxes. So for most families, they would have to give up on eating, on recreation, on clothing themselves, on transportation, to be mathematically capable of making payments on the average home. So the young people, for them it's even worse because they do not have a nest egg. They cannot actually afford a down payment that has got doubled in the last nine years. And that is why 76% of Canadians tell, who don't own homes tell pollsters they believe they never will. So, Madam Minister, do we want to live in a country where the only people, the only young people who can afford a down payment are those whose parents can do, pay it for them? No, but that is the country we live in today. Do you want to live in a country where we make the investments we need in health care, in housing and old age pensions, but we lack the political will to pay for them and choose instead to pass a ballooning debt onto our children. <laughs> like, are we living in the twilight zone here? <laughs> yes. This, this is her words. Do we want to live in a country where we pass the, the bill onto our children with ballooning debt, she asks, as she's ballooning the debt, adding $40 billion to the debt as she gives a speech about the perils of passing on ballooning debt to our children, as she is the finance minister for the government that has added more debt than all previous governments combined in the preceding century and a half. It's worth noting that the Prime Minister has added his deficits as a share of GDP were bigger than we had in World War I in the Great Depression, in the Great Global Recession of 2008 and 9. And I should also note that the majority of debt that has been added under this Prime Minister was unrelated to COVID. Mm -hmm. So the dog ate my homework excuse of blaming COVID for all of that is wrong in Canada no longer works. I will add that we are now three years past COVID and the deficits and debt continue to grow, putting a lie to that entire endless, nauseating excuse that the government has made. This Prime Minister has added so much debt that we are now spending more on interest for that debt than we are on health care. $54.1 billion in debt interest this year, more money for those wealthy, bankers and bondholders who own our debt and less money for the doctors and nurses that we await when we sit for 26 hours in the average emergency room right across this country. Madam Speaker, no, we do not want to live in a country that passes on a ballooning debt to our children, but after nine years of this Prime Minister, that is exactly the country we live in. Do you want to live in a country where those at the very top Live lives of luxury. Who does that remind you of? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, look the other side. <laughs> There's somebody who flies around in a private jet to stay on secret islands on other sides on the other side of the hemisphere where they treat him to eight and nine thousand dollar a day luxuries and he pays for it with the tax dollars of Canadians and emits 
thousands of tons of greenhouse gases into our atmosphere. Somebody luxuriates in that way at the expense of everyone else, and he is he shall be remained he shall remain unnamed because we cannot say the prime minister's name in the House of Commons. So I will not break that parliamentary rule. But I do point out the irony. But. We must live in gated communities. So I'll start again. Do you want to live in a country where those at the very top live lives of luxury, but most do so in gated communities, behind ever higher fences, using private health care and airplanes, because the public sphere is so degraded and the wrath of the majority of the wrath of the majority of their less privileged compatriots burns so hot? Wow. She says that the wrath of the majority of the less privileged compatriots burns so hot. Madam Speaker, she's right that some people don't have the ability to live in gated communities behind armed guards. Those people are told that they should leave the keys next to the doors so that the car thieves can just walk in and peacefully steal their cars. Madam Speaker, you go to the communities across this country that are being ravaged by crime, chaos, drugs, and disorder. What she describes is it exactly what is happening after nine years of this government. We have nurses in British Columbia hospitals that are terrified to go to work because this Prime Minister in, in collusion with the NDP Premier of BC has decriminalized hard drugs and allowed the worst criminals to bring weapons and narcotics into their hospital rooms where they can't be confronted. We have 26 international students crammed into the basement of one Brampton home. We have a car stolen every 40 minutes in the GTA. We have a 100% increase in gun killings across this country. Madam Speaker, we have communities where people are not, who are terrified to go out. We have small businesses across Brampton and Surrey that are being, they're receiving letters weekly warning them that if they don't write checks for millions of dollars to extortionists, their homes will be shot up and their children will have bullets fly through the windows of their, as they are sleeping. That is life in Canada today. So do we want to live in that country? No, we don't want to live in that country. And after eight years of rising costs, rising crime, and rising chaos, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost, and we will replace him with a common-sense Conservative government. Hey, that hey, we're So what does that country look like and how are we going to get there? Fortunately, we have a common sense plan that will axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget and stop the crime. Let's start with the tax, the carbon tax, that it went up 23 percent on April 1st. Now we see the raging gas prices at the pumps in across Ontario. Chaos as people are trying desperately to get to the pumps and fill up before the latest hikes go ahead. And this Prime Minister celebrate saying that high gas prices are his purpose and he has the full support of the NDP leader on most days when the NDP leader uh, can figure out what his policy is. Uh, the NDP leader has voted 22 times to hike the carbon tax and both parties have, along with the help of the bloc, voted for future increases that will quadruple the tax to 61 cents a litre, a tax that will also apply on home heating bills and, of course, a tax that applies on the farmers who produce the food and the truckers who ship the food, therefore on all who buy the food. That's why Common Sense Conservatives will axe the tax to bring home lower prices. We take exactly the opposite approach of this Prime Minister when it comes to protecting our environment. His approach is to raise the cost on traditional energy we still need. Our approach is to lower the cost on other alternatives. We will green like green projects like nuclear power, hydroelectric dams, 
carbon capture and storage, uh, mining of critical minerals like lithium, cobalt, uh, uh, copper, and others. We will do this by repealing the unconstitutional Bill C-69 so that we can approve these projects in 18 months rather than in 18 years. Here's the difference. He wants taxes. I want technology. He wants to drive, he wants to drive our money to the dirty dictators abroad. I want to bring it home in powerful paychecks for our people in this country. Yeah. Yeah. The same approach that will allow us to unleash energy abundance and affordability uh, by ro is the approach we will take to build the homes. That is to say, getting the government gatekeepers out of the way. Why do we have the worst housing inflation in the G7 after nine years of this Prime Minister? Why have housing costs risen 40 percent faster than paychecks? Uh, by far the worst gap of any G7 country. Why did UBS say Toronto was the worst housing bubble in the world, Vancouver the third most overpriced when comparing median income to median house price, uh, according to Demographia. Why? Because we have the worst bureaucracy when it comes to home building. After nine years of this Prime Minister, Canada has the second slowest building permits out of nearly 40 OECD countries. These permitting costs add $1.3 million to the cost of every newly built home in Vancouver, $350,000 to every newly built home in Toronto. Winnipeg blocked 2,000 homes next to a transit station that was built for those homes. But the city of Montreal has blocked 25,000 homes in the last uh, seven years. And there are literally hundreds of thousands of homes that are waiting to be built but are locked up in slow permitting processes. And what do we have as a solution? Well, the Prime Minister has taken the worst in immigration minister in our country's history, the guy that the Prime Minister blamed for causing out-of-control temporary immigration to balloon housing prices, and put him in charge of housing. Now, since that time, that minister has said that his housing accelerator fund of $4 billion doesn't actually build any homes. And since he's doled out all of this cash to, this, to political friends in uh, incompetent city halls across this country, home building has dropped. In fact, home building is down this year, and according to the federal government's housing agency, it will be down next year, and again the year after that. That is a housing decelerator, not accelerator. So that's what happens when you choose a minister because he's a media darling and a fast talker, rather than someone who gets things done, as I did when I was housing minister and the rent was only $973 a month for the average family right across country, the country, uh, and the average house price was roughly 400 grand. That's results. There was less talk, there was less government spending, but far more homes. And that's what we're, our common sense plan will do again. Build the homes by requiring municipalities speed up, permit more land, and more building faster. They will be required to permit 15 percent more homes per year as a condition of getting federal funding and to permit high-rise apartments around every federally funded transit station. We will sell off 6,000 acres of 6,000 federal buildings and thousands of acres of federal land to build, build, build. We'll get rid of the carbon tax to lower the cost of, of building materials. Mm -hmm. And finally, we will reward the working people who build homes because we need more boots, not more suits. We'll pass the common sense conservative law that allows you to trades workers to write off the full cost of transportation, food and accommodation to go from one work site to another so that they can build the homes while bringing home paychecks for themselves. Yeah. Madam Speaker. These homes will be in safe neighborhoods. We will stop the crime. We will stop the crime by making repeat violent offenders ineligible for bail, parole, or house arrest. That will mean no more catch and release. We will repeal C-5, that the house arrest law. We will repeal C-75, 
the catch and release law, and we will repeal C83, the cushy living for multiple murderers law that allows Paul Bernardo to enjoy tennis courts and uh, skating rinks that most Canadian fa tax-paying families can no longer afford uh, outside of prison. We will bring in jail, not bail, jail, not bail for repeat violent offenders. We will repeal, in fact, the entire criminal, the catch and release criminal justice agenda that this radical prime minister, with the help of the loony left NDP has brought in, Madam Speaker. It will the radical agenda that has turned our, many of our streets into war zones will be a thing of a past. We will also stop giving out deadly narcotics. We now, you know, remember when I made a, I made a video about the so-called safe supply. I went to the, the tragic site of yet another homeless en encampment uh, in Vancouver. Uh, which used to be one of the most beautiful views in that spot in the entire world, right now has been, uh, unfortunately, a place where people live in squalor and where they die of overdoses. And everyone said it was just terrible that I was planning to take away the tax-funded drugs and that all of the claims I made were just a bunch of conspiracy theories. Well, everything I said then has been proven accurate every word of it. And I noticed that Liberals and the pointy-headed professors that they relied on for their policies have all gone into hiding as well. Why? Because the facts are now coming out. The, even the public a, uh, health agency in British Columbia, which has been pushing this NDP Liberal ideology, is admitting that the tax-funded hydromorphine is being diverted. The police in Vancouver said this week that 50 percent of all the high-powered hydromorphine op opioids are paid for with tax dollars and given out by public health agencies, Madam Speaker, supposedly to save lives. Now we know that those very powerful drugs are being resold to children who are getting hooked on them and the profits are being used to buy even more dangerous fentanyl and trank and other drugs that are leaving our people face first on the pavement dying of record overdoses. They, the so-called experts that always say, ignore the bumper stickers, look at the facts. Well, the facts are in. In British Columbia, where this radical and incomparable policy has been most enthusiastically embraced, overdose deaths are up 300 percent. They have risen in BC faster than anywhere else in Canada and possibly anywhere else in North America. The state of Oregon, the ultra-progressive state of Oregon has reversed decriminalization, recognizing the total chaos and death and destruction that the policy has caused. And what is this Prime Minister, this radical Prime Minister, with the help of his NDP counterpart do? They look at the death and destruction that has occurred in the downtown east side of Vancouver and in other communities and they say, let's have more of that. Let's take that. They took a walk down the downtown east side, or better yet, they probably drove through in their limousines, their bulletproof limousines, these two uh, politicians did. And they said, and they looked around at the people bent over as they were completely tranquilized by fentanyl. They saw the people lying face first on the ground, they saw the tents that the police would have pointed out are filled with dangerous guns and drugs. They saw all the small businesses that were shuttered by this policy, and they said, let's have more of that. Let's replicate all the policies that created it so that we can have tent cities and homeless encampments in every corner of the country. And that is exactly what they've done. In Halifax, there are 35 homeless encampments in one city, Madam Speaker, after eight, sorry, nine years of this Prime Minister, his NDP counterpart, and the Liberal Mayor of Halifax. 
Look at every town in this country. You will find homeless encampments that never existed before the last nine years. This policy will go down in infamy as one of the most insane experiments ever carried out on a population. Nowhere else in the world are they doing this. this is like, they, they, they gaslight. They love to say, oh, this is what all the, all the civilized people are, believe, is that giving out these drugs will save lives. Nowhere else in the world is this done. In fact, when you tell people that it's happening, they have a hard time even believing it. What, sir, you're giving out heroin-grade drugs for free to addicts and expecting it's going to save lives? And now they spill into our hospitals where nurses are told by the NDP government in BC and the Liberal government in Ottawa that they are not allowed to take away crack pipes or knives or guns. They're just supposed to expect someone is going to consume the drugs, have a massive fit and start slashing up the hospital floor. Madam Speaker, this is something out of a bad hallucination and a hallucination that will come to an end when I am Prime Minister. We will end this nightmare. And we will, Madam Speaker, we will also ensure that Canadians have a better way. We're not only going to ban the drugs, we're not only going to stop giving out taxpayer-funded drugs, we are going to provide treatment and recovery. If, if you were out there, if you were watching today and you're suffering from addiction and you don't know how you can turn your life around, I want you to know that there is hope. There is a better future ahead. We will put the money into beautiful treatment centers with counseling, group therapy, physical exercise, yoga, sweat lodges for First Nations, where people can graduate drug-free, live in nearby housing that helps them transition into a law-abiding drug-free life, come back to the center to get a counseling session, a workout, or maybe even to mentor an incoming addict on the hopeful future that is ahead. That is the way that we are going to bring our loved ones home drug-free. Yeah. As I always say, we are going to have a common sense dollar for dollar law requiring we find one dollar of savings for every new dollar of spending. And in this case, that will include how we will partly pay for this. We will unleash the biggest lawsuit in Canadian history against the corrupt pharmaceutical companies that profited off of this nightmare. We will make them pay. Here. Yeah. Here. Finally, we will stop the, drug, the, the gun crime. We know, Madam Speaker, the gun crime is out of control. Just yesterday, we saw this gold heist where we found out that, that by the way, all the gold thieves, they're out on bail already, not to worry. <laughs> oh. They'll have to send this Prime Minister a nugget of gold to thank him for passing C-75 uh, for, and letting them out of jail the, within a few days of this monster gold heist. We knew that, the, why, why did they steal the gold? So that they could buy the guns. Because we know that all the gun crime is happening with stolen guns. See, the Prime Minister wants to ban all civilian law-abiding people from owning guns, but he wants to allow every criminal to have as many guns as they want. And I'm not just talking about rifles. I'm talking about machine guns, fully loaded machine guns that are being found on the street that never, never existed since they were banned in the 70s. But now the criminals can get them because the prime minister has mismanaged the federal borders and ports and because he's wasting so much money going after the good guys. He wants to ban your hunting rifle. He said so in a, June, in a December 20, 2022 interview with CTV. It was very clear. If you have a hunting rifle, we will, he said we, he will have to take it away. And he kept his word by introducing a 300-page amendment to his Bill C-21, which would have banned 300 pages of the most popular and safe hunting rifles. It was, he only put that policy on hold because of a backlash that common sense conservatives led that included rural Canadians, 
First Nations Canadians, NDPers from rural communities like yours, Madam Speaker, had to flip-flop. I know that in places like Capus Casing, the law-abiding people uh, uh, enjoy hunting, and we know that while your leader and the Prime Minister look down on those people and think that they are to blame for crime, we know that the, the hunters in the Capus Casing are the salt of the earth, they're the best people around, and we're going to make sure that they can keep their hunting right. God love them. God love them. God love every one of them. Madam Speaker, while the Prime Minister wants to protect turkeys from hunters, common sense conservatives want to protect Canadians from criminals. And that is why we will repeal his insane policies. By the way, I should point out, he hasn't actually done any of the bans. Remember, he, he had that big uh, press conference during the election, and he said, he said to his policy team that morning, I need you to come up with a policy that will allow me to put a big, scary-looking black gun on my podium sign. And then they said, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll think of something. And he put that scary-looking gun on his podium sign. He said, well, I'm going to ban all of these assault rifles. Well, they asked him, what is an assault rifle? He said, well, I don't know, but it's that, that black, scary thing on the front of my podium sign is the, is the assault rifle we're referring to. And, and all these years later, it's now, what is it, three years later since he made the promise? He was asked again in the hallways, what is an assault rifle? Well, I'm still working to figure it out, he says. So these rifles that he says he's going to ban one day, he doesn't know what they are, but one day he's going to figure it out and he's going to ban them. In the meantime, he has spent $40 million to buy exactly zero guns from owners. He said that he was going to ban them and buy them from the owners. Not one gun has been taken off the street, $40 million. Madam Speaker, we could have used that money to hire CBSA officers who would have secured our ports against the thousands of illegal guns that are pouring in and killing people on our streets. When I am Prime Minister, we will cancel this multi-billion dollar waste of money. We will use it to hire frontline boots on the ground who will inspect those shipping containers and scanners that can peer in, pierce and side to stop the drugs, stop the illegal guns, stop the export of our stolen cars, here, here. stop the crime. Yeah. Madam Speaker, what you're seeing here is a very different philosophical approach. The, the, the finance minister said in her concluding remarks that what we need is a bigger and stronger government. Oh. Doesn't that sound eerie, a bigger and, in other words, she and he want to be bigger and stronger, yeah. right? Yeah. right? And that's why they're always trying to make Canadians feel weaker and smaller. He literally called our people a small fringe yeah. minority. He jabs his fingers in the faces of our citizens. He calls small businesses tax cheats. He claims hunters are just Americans. Can, if you own a hunting rifle, you're just an American. He points his fingers at people who disagree with him. He has the audacity of claiming anyone who is offside with him is a racist. This a guy who dressed up in racist costumes so many times, he can't remember them all. He's been denigrating other people his whole life. That's because it's all about him. It's all about concentrating more power and more money in his hands. This budget is no different. It's about a bigger government and smaller citizens. It's about buying his way through the next election with cash that the working class people have earned and he has burned. By contrast, I want the opposite. I want smaller government to make room for bigger citizens. I want a state that is a servant and not the master. I want a country where the, rep the prime minister actually lives up to the meaning of the word prime. First, minister, servant. That's what minister means. Minister is not master. Minister is servant. We need a country that puts people back in charge 
of their money, their communities, their families, and their lives. A country based on the common sense of the common people, united for our common home. Your home, my home, our home. Let's bring it home. And so I, I move, seconded by the member for Megantic Lerab, that the motion be amended by deleting all words after the word that and substituting the following. The House reject the government's budget since it, fa it fails to a. Axe the tax on farmers and food by passing Bill C-234 in its original form. B. Build the homes, not bureaucracy, by requiring cities permit 15 percent more home building each year as a condition for receiving federal infrastructure money. C. Cap the spending with a dollar-for-dollar dollar law rule to bring down interest rates and inflation by requiring the government to find a dollar in savings for every new dollar of spending. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Anyone new to the channel, please like and subscribe to help support the channel.